Patrick Haggard is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London. And he moved there directly in the 1990s from a postdoc in Oxford. But before that, he was an undergraduate here and has sat where everyone is sitting. Uh, but he took a course that our department sadly abolished uh, because Patrick started as a philosopher. And there was a wonderful course that had run for a century in the Moral Sciences Tripos, uh, which was philosophy. Uh, it was called Empirical Psychology with Practical Exercises. And there are two of us present. You won't believe this. Um, but there are two of us present who actually had the privilege of teaching Mark when he took that course in his second year. And we must have had some effect because he changed into experimental psychology for part two and is now, of course, one of the country's leading experimental psychologists. Patrick. Well, thank you very much for that lovely um, introduction, John. It's uh, very kind of you. I have kept one of your essays. No pressure. Uh, well, yeah, it's very nice to be back, and thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about quality and location, and this sounds like an advertisement for an estate agency, um, but in fact, I think it's going back to some quite basic ideas about how the mind works, and I'm going to be speaking specifically uh, about those problems from the point of view of my own research interest, which is somatic sensations, so all the sensory systems of the body. Um, and uh, just to give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about in the next um, 50 minutes, uh, I'm going to first of all talk about how one might measure minimal units of sensory quality. So philosophers talk about qualia, I'm going to try to measure a single quale. I'm going to show how you can test theories about sensory quality on neural populations using psychophysics. Then I'm going to change gear and stop talking about classic uh, sort of sensory quality and talk about spatial perception. So there is in fact a link which I'll try and make. And I'm going to ask whether spatial perception is fundamentally motoric, depends ultimately on motor signals. And I'm going to talk about perceptual learning for spatial uh, experience. So um, first of all, I need to define sensory quality because it's it's a slightly unusual word, and it's not widely used. So I'm going to use the phrase, the phrase sensory quality to refer to the raw phenomenology of sensation. So what sensations feel like, what a sensation feels like. Crucially, we have many sensations, and they differ between each other. And one of the ways in which they differ is in their quality. They also differ in things like intensity, but I'm talking about quality. So for example, seeing and hearing feel different. They have different sensory qualities. Okay? So um, the differentiation between sensations is often a matter of, of, of sensory quality. Philosophers talk about qualia, and when they talk about qualia, what they really mean is some sort of raw feel. That if I see red, then the redness is somehow self-intimating. It's immune from error. You can't tell me that I'm actually seeing blue because I'm seeing red and I'm, I'm not going to be corrected by you. And it's some intrinsic first-personness of my sensation. So often in psychology, when we think about sensory quality, we end up with modality, vision, hearing, touch, and so on. Modality is one core way in which sensations vary in quality. It's not the only way, and as you'll see, uh, as you'll see later. And it seems so fundamental that there are these sensory qualities. It seems that it's something that happens almost before the textbook begins. But, you know, why? Why can't we investigate uh, how sensory quality works, why there are so many different sensory qualities, etc. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to try to isolate what I'm talking about sensory quality by uh, measuring a minimal unit of sensory quality. And I'm going to focus particularly on an idea called labeled line coding, which has also been called the law of specific nerve energies, and it's also called place coding. None of these terms are great. And the key person is this rather sort of um, gruff-looking gentleman, Johannes Müller, who was a professor of uh, physiology in Berlin, 
And he said the nerves of the senses are not mere passive conductors, but that each particular peculiar nerve of sense has special powers or qualities which, which the exciting causes merely render manifest. It's quite hard to read, and I think the translation isn't great. Sensation, therefore, consists in the communication to the sensorium, that means the brain, not of the quality or state of the external body in the world, but of the condition of the nerves themselves excited by the external cause. So let's try and unpack that a little bit. The real problem here is that the brain receives lots of sensory signals from different sensory organs, and they're all in the form of action potentials, and all action potentials are basically the same. If you record an action potential in the uh, acoustic nerve, it's pretty much the same as an action potential in the optic nerve, and it's pretty much the same as an action potential in the medial and discus, which carries sen sensations of touch. How come these very similar action potentials cause very, very different sensations? That's the problem. How can the same unit of communication produce different feelings? And the thought that Muller had is that action potentials are somehow labelled, notice the quote marks, by the nerve in which they travel. So some receiving centre can work out that because that nerve is, uh, that action potential is coming from the optic nerve, it's, it's a different sensation from an action potential in the acoustic nerve. Different sensory receptors can therefore cause different sensory qualities, right, because the the action potentials to which the receptives give rise are traveling in different nerves. Uh, this is not, a, um, what do I put here? Um, often we think about this as modality and sensory quality, but the basic idea that different neurons mean different things actually has a very wide application. If you think about feature detection, so you can detect oriented bars in the visual system, but what is it about the receiving neuron that knows that an action potential coming in neuron A means oriented to the left, and an action potential in neuron B means oriented to the right. If you think about all neural tuning, it ultimately implies that the receiving neuron can somehow identify what the incoming action potential means according to which nerve it arrives in. All right? A little bit complicated, but quite deep idea. Just think about why is sight different from hearing. Here's a way to schematize that. So if you imagine that there's a stimulus which impinges on a receptor, let's say in the skin or in the retina, we can imagine that some sort of label is written as the action potential travels up the afferent nerve, and when it reaches the brain, or what Muller called the sensorium, this label is somehow read so that you can have a different sensation according to whether the signal comes along this line rather than this line. So that's why the lines are labeled. All right? And I want to talk about this in the, in the context of thermosensation. So I want to tell you about a couple of experiments that we've recently done on the sensations of warmth and cold, which are just interesting to explore this idea that somehow neural signals are labelled. So the way that uh, thermal sensation works is quite interesting, because the continuous underlying physical dimension of temperature is not sensed by a single type of temperature neuron. It's sensed by lots of different kinds of receptors, which respond within particular ranges. So the, um, the different receptors respond to particular portions of the temperature axis according to the uh, trip protein molecules that they express in their membrane. So it's actually just molecular chemistry which determines whether you feel, feel cold or warm. So the Trip M8 receptor, which is the one that you find in menthol, this is the reason why mint feels cold. Uh, the, the neurons which express the Trip M8 receptor, they will discharge, this is the firing rate of the neuron in impulses per second, for a stimulus in the range 10 to 40 degrees, whereas neurons which express Trip v, V4 and Trip V3, so called warm receptors, they will respond in the warm range, so sort of 30 to 45. Baseline skin temperature is around 32. So it's a little bit of overlap, but basically in different regions of the temperature scale, you have different populations of neurons that will respond. Okay, so you've got different receptors. It looks like a candidate for labeled lines. You've got different neurons projecting to the, to the brain. Here, here are the actual free nerve endings in the skin. We don't know whether this is a cold or a warm receptor. Um, but that depends on the molecules that are, that are embedded um, in the membrane. So you've got two discrete, two discrete receptor molecules, and the sensory qualities of warm and cold 
are direct results of firing in the corresponding afferent neurons. All right? So this idea is old, and it's in all the medical textbooks, and it basically is almost all that neurologists actually learn about perception and sensation, uh, as far as I can see. And it's all due to this uh, uh, also rather august gentleman, uh, Magnus Blix. So Magnus Blix was the first person to measure um, spots in the skin which seem to be ultra-sensitive, either to slightly cold or slightly warm temperatures. So he built an elaborate apparatus where he passed slightly cooled or slightly warm water through a tube and gradually moved the tube over his own skin. And he found little spots around a millimeter in diameter where he would suddenly start to feel that the apparatus was cold, that's the green spot, or it was warm, that's the orange spot. And the theory was that when you have this, ex this experience of cold or warmth, then the apparatus is being held immediately over one of these uh, nerve endings. So you're really stimulating a single functional receptor, right? So these uh, cold and warm sensitive spots are a, a classic feature of textbook physiology. And then they're really what you read in, in, in medicine about, the, about consciousness, really, about the reason why there are different sensations. So one spot is one functional sensory receptor unit. And the interesting thing, which I fear we're going to see obscured down here, is that there's one participant, as far as I can work out, in this experiment. And it was done 137 years ago. So this is a massively cited uh, work. And it's in all of the neuroscience textbooks. And the underlying reference is Blix, 1885. And I could only find two copies of that. One is in uh, Stockholm and the other is in Yale. Um, so this is actually scanned from the uh, copy in Stockholm. Now, my Swedish is not very good, but it looks like he tested it on himself. So we thought it might be time to, to replicate, because replication is good. And uh, we use this thermostimulator, which is a computer-controlled uh, Peltier device. And if you hold this metal end onto the skin, then you can basically control the skin temperature um, uh, at will. And we move the, uh, the probe over the skin of the, the dorsal uh, forearm uh, in a sweeping light motion. And we have it at a temperature which is just very, very slightly warmer than skin baseline. So skin baseline we measure in each individual person, and then we make the probe maybe two degrees warmer, or we make it two degrees colder. And as this happens, you basically have no real thermal sensation at all. It feels thermally neutral. And then suddenly, oh, now it feels cold, or oh, now it feels warm. So you have a sudden thermal sensation, and that's presumably because we've scanned across one of these cold sensitive spots. Now when we do that, we then um, uh, scan in more detail with a much smaller probe, which is an aluminium wire which has been preheated or cooled in a water bath. So we start off by looking for sort of big sites, and then if we find a site which is thermosensitive, then within it we scan for these small spots, which are um, typically around one millimeter diameter. Yeah? Do the subjects know whether to expect cold or warm? Um, so we do those in separate blocks. So they yeah. do? Yeah. Um, so, oh, well, let me see if I can remember that. Um, but, 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 but. We, do, we, do, we do it in short blocks, so each scan, you can't easily change the temperature while you're scanning. You can't easily change temperature while you're scanning. So the duration of the scan is that you keep going until you find a spot, right? But it's relevant because it, it, they make mistakes, which is going to come up. Okay, so this is the data that you get. So here are eight participants uh, tested in four sessions, and we managed to find 334 of these spots. So the spots are the small, tiny locations that you find within these thermosensitive sites. So you can just about see the um, outline. This is the upper arm, this is the forearm, and this is the wrist. And the color uh, plot here is that the blues are cold sensitive spots where this very slightly cold probe suddenly is felt as cold, um, uh, red is warm. But the interesting thing is that a very large number of spots, which are shown here as yellow, people feel as warm. And then if you try to confirm by scanning across the same spot in another direction, they'll say, oh, it feels cold. So a remarkable number of the experiences that people had seem to be labile or changing or unstable or inconsistent. So here are our eight participants, and this is the number of spots that we could find of each kind in each participant. Uh, you'll see that there are more blue, uh, the blue bar is higher than the red bar, so cold sensitive spots are more common than warm sensitive. 
but an astonishing 49% of the thermosensitive spots that we found were inconsistent. And what this means is that the first time you find it, the person will say it feels cold, and then if you try again seconds later, they'll say, oh, now it feels warm. And that is odd. That's really odd. To me, that doesn't seem consistent with the idea that the line is labeled and that the action potential is somehow carrying a label to the brain saying, I'm coming from a cold receptor or I'm coming from a warm receptor. So if these are labeled lines, the labeling process is really noisy. Now, is that a discovery? I don't know. There are always, there's always noise in biological processes. But the way that we think about modality and about sensory quality never really has much discussion of noise. And in philosophy, the idea of qualia, self-intimating, immune from error, you never really think that they have this intrinsic variability. Another thing which was quite surprising for us is that we did these spot mappings on day one with plus or minus two degrees, that's a slightly warm and slightly cold, we repeated them a day later, and then a month later we repeated them with slightly stronger stimuli. And the spot conservation, in other words the probability of finding the same spot again between any two sessions was basically zero. So these spots are not kind of there in your skin in any stable sense, and that's surprising because the receptors are assumed to remain in fixed locations. I don't think the free nerve endings will sort of wander around in the skin. We don't have any anatomical belief in that. And we think that we can reposition and remap uh, the arm pretty well to within a millimeter. So this instability of the, of the um, labeled lines points towards the idea that activating a receptor may be pretty probabilistic. So a particular cold receptor might fire, but then if you test it again a little bit later, it might not. That's fairly consistent with what we know about how many neurons work, but it's still slightly surprising given the way that people have thought about labeled lines. Um, I think I'll skip this just for the interest of time, and now go straight on to another thermosensory study, where we're going to try to look not at the sort of single functional receptor and these minimal tiny units of cold experience and warmth experience, but look at something more macroscopic. So let's look at neural populations, and we're going to use exactly the same stimulator, but we're going to use it... Uh, use the large-scale stimulator, which has a diameter at the tip of around um, 11 millimeters. So if you touch it, for example, on the back of your hand, you're going to be covering, st effectively stimulating many, many receptors, not just a single ending, as we were before. Okay? And uh, we're going to um, uh, ask people to um, respond to just detectable increases or decreases from the individual baseline skin temperature. And um, uh, uh, this one is blocked. So I, was, I made a mistake when I asked this. So the previous one was randomized. This one is blocked. Sorry, this one's randomized as well. I'm sorry, I've got that one. This one's randomized too. <laughs> uh, and we adjust the stimulus so that people are roughly 75% correct in detecting whether there is an increase or a decrease. So you've got to have a stimulus which is just about detectable. We're going to deliver 60 cold stimuli, 60 warm stimuli, and 120 stimuli, which are catch stimuli because there's actually no temperature change at all, and uh, we've got a power calculation. So the thing that's interesting here is we're going to ask two questions on every trial. First of all, we're going to ask a detection question. Did you feel any temperature change? Was there any thermal stimulus there at all? And you can see that sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes it's no. This is a classic signal detection theory approach. After each uh, stimulation, we're then going to ask a second question, which would be a sensory quality identification question. Very often people call this discrimination, but the correct term is actually identification, not discrimination. The identification question is, was it a decrease or an increase? Okay, so was that stimulus cold or was it warm? Now remember that people may have said that they didn't actually feel any temperature change at all, but we're still going to say, okay, or was it cold or was it warm? And if you don't know, just guess. Okay, so that's a fairly standard sort of uh, judgment. Okay. So the trial structure is, um, this is as a function of time here, is that the temperature will either increase or decrease, and during that period a tone plays. And we ask the person, did you feel any temperature change during the tone, yes or no? What's your level of confidence in your answer, one to four? Was what you felt an increase or a decrease in temperature? What's your level of confidence in your answer? And only then do we actually bring the temperature back down to, to, to baseline. Okay? 
So let's just think about what the, the concept is here. What, why are we doing this experiment? What might we what, what might we say? So labeled line theories, the idea that each neuron carries a signature saying this is cold or this is warm. Labeled line theories imply a very strong logical relationship between having a sensation, which is what you measure by detection tasks, and experiencing the specific sensory quality of that sensation, which is what you measure by identification tasks. So if you're a labeled line theorist, then you would say, if you detect it, you must know whether it was warm or cold. Detection is sufficient for identification. Similarly, if you don't detect it, you cannot possibly know whether it was warm or cold, right? Because, um, if, because the um, sensory quality is attached to the detectable actual potential. So detection is therefore necessary for identification. So we can test both of those in experiments. So first of all, what I'm going to show you is the test of the idea, if you detect it, you must know whether it's warm or cold. In other words, detection is sufficient for identification. So what we've got here is the, the trials where the person said they detected something, the hits. People said, I had a thermal sensation. And then we're going to ask you, OK, was it an increase or a decrease? And if the label line theory is correct, you should be at ceiling throughout. Because if you've had a sensation, you must know its sensory quality. So people are never sort of consistently at ceiling, because sometimes they're checking their phone or they're looking at cat videos. So we took, and as an effective um, ceiling, 94%. And we can look at whether these 24 participants are significantly uh, different from ceiling performance on either cold trials or warm trials where they detected that there was a stimulus. So we've got 130, 1,032 detection hits. We're using a mixed model approach. And we can test uh, this uh, group data against the effective ceiling of 94%. And both for cold and for warmth, we found that if you can detect it, you must know whether it was cold or warm. So this is exactly what labeled line theory would say. So this is really interesting. It's quite similar to this first experiment with the spots. It's just a bigger scale. It's just presumably stimulating many receptors rather than a single receptor. The second part of this question is the idea that um, if you do not detect a stimulus, you cannot possibly know whether it was warm or cold. Detection Is detection necessary for identification? So the critical idea here is if you just look at the detection misses, these are the trials where the person said, no, nope, I didn't feel anything. No thermal sensation. Waste of time. Nothing doing. And if you say, OK, but was it warm or was it cold? And they look at you and you say, well, go on, guess. Right? The key question is whether they can guess better than chance. Because if they can guess better than chance, then they have some access to information about sensory quality for a sensation that they didn't even detect. And then you've kind of driven a wedge between detection and quality, and you've managed to separate them. So there aren't that many detection misses, but there are some. And we can apply this mixed model logistic regression. And it turns out that it looks as though people are better than chance, both for cold stimuli that they do not detect, that's this blue, and for warm stimuli that they do not detect. So the black line here indicates chance performance, and you can see that the group mean looks like it's above. So um, the question is, can you, you, it looks as though you can access information about sensory quality, even when you have no detectable sensation. So this is quite interesting as an analogy for blind sight. Right? So in blind sight, you, you say you can't see it, but you still seem to be able to access some information about it. So we've um, uh, coined the term thermal blind sight for this. Um, we think uh, it might be a thing. And if it's a thing, it's very difficult for labeled line hypotheses to explain. It's very difficult to explain how you would have access to the label, but not actually recognize that any signal had arrived. It seems to be one of these wedges between the action potential and the putative kind of label that, that, that is attached to it. So you might think, OK, this is great. Uh, blind sight is back in business in, in a different uh, guise. But we need to be very, very careful here. There are several problems with what I've um, shown here. So I want to give you the buts. I want to give you now some rather complicated um, explanation of why, in fact, I don't think we can treat this as evidence against label line hypothesis. So I'm sorry that the next slide is a bit texty. We're going to ask, is thermal blind sight real? Is this phenomenon that people can guess above chance the cold warmth quality of a stimulus that they can't even feel? Is it real? 
And the thing to remember is that when in a signal detection type task, some of the detection hits and some of the detection misses are probably not real hits and real misses. They're probably just lucky guesses or something. And if we have a real detection hit that we really believe the person did detect something rather than just say yes, then we could use that to test the label line hypothesis. And if we have a real miss where the person really didn't feel anything, then we could use that to test the label line hypothesis. But only the real ones, not the kind of lucky ones. So only the real hits are relevant to testing the hypothesis. So how do we know which of the detection hits are real and which are not real? Well, we do have a confidence rating. So if, for example, somebody says they didn't feel anything, so it's a detection miss, but, and they give a very high confidence rating, so they say, I'm absolutely confident I didn't feel anything at all. That's likely to be a real miss. And this, this subset can give a stronger test of label line theory than, for example, a trial where people say, well, I think I didn't feel anything, but I've got, I'm pretty uncertain. Okay. Similarly, at the trait level, at the individual um, uh, participant level, you're going to get some people who have a very conservative detection criteria. So those are people who are going to make a lot of misses. And they're going to make a lot of misses even when there's actually something there because they just, they just don't trust themselves. And these people are not very good for testing label line theories because when they say, when they give a detection miss, it's not a real miss. So we can add these two, these two confounders, the trial-wise confidence and the participant-wise uh, detection criteria, into the mixed model for testing thermal blindside. We just put them into the logistic regression. And when you do that, after the confounder adjustments, the evidence for the labeled line theory disappears because now for cold it's you know pretty use a pretty weak trend or nothing at all, and for warm it really is nothing at all. So um, after there's no strong evidence for thermal blind sight after a careful analysis, there's no strong evidence for a gap between detection and identification. The labeled line hypothesis remains intact when you think about neural populations. I'm not sure I could believe it when we tried to test it with tiny spots at single receptor level. Um, but it does seem to work for neural populations. And we probably need to do more, more quantitative modeling of that um, to look at these uh, noise processes. So just to summarize so far, classic labeled line theories lack any idea of noise in sensory quality. And this may be a problem because the noise on a single line seems to be considerable. But most sensations involve many receptors. And this, of course, reduces noise levels, right? So averaging over a population will always improve your signal to noise ratio. And at the level of populations, it looks like the label line theory holds. And this is quite interesting because it, it, it's not the way that we read about label line theory historically. The original idea seemed to be that sensory, quali sensory quality would actually be hardwired into the afferent neuron somehow. And it, it, that doesn't seem to be the case. So sensory quality is not hardwired into individual afferent neurons. Maybe instead it reflects how we learn the natural statistics of stimuli. Maybe we just learn that cold and warm feel different rather than, as it were, being born with neurons which transmit different labels. So how might this work, this sort of empiricist idea that we can uh, uh, acquire sensory quality? Well, imagine a population of neurons which just receives the natural statistics of all its input. So in the case of thermal neurons, it will experience warm and cold environments. And you can imagine that some sort of principal components or data reduction process is just going to parse this natural variation. And that will end up separating warm from cold. So I searched principal components analysis on uh, uh, Google looking for a nice image. This is actually um, detection of tumors. Uh, but because it's so beautifully in blue and in red, I thought this is exactly what I mean about how you might learn to separate cold and warmth. because. Uh, you will learn from experience that neurons, uh, the blue neurons and the red neurons tend to respond on different occasions. Remember that those receptor molecules have non-overlapping distributions on the, on the receptor axis, so the on the temperature axis. So the first principal component will teach you that there are two different sensory qualities. What you haven't yet done is you haven't explained the hard problem. So the hard problem of consciousness remains you've managed to generate two different sensory qualities just by looking at the natural statistics of the input. But you haven't explained why does a given input pattern feel cold or feel warm. So, you know, a philosopher might still be unsatisfied. Okay, um, I'm going to switch now to uh, probably a slightly shorter section where I'm going to talk about spatial perception. <laughs>
So it's still somatic sensation, it's still bodily sensation, but you can forget about cold and warm. So this is also a question about sensory quality, but I'm going to have to take you through a little bit of history to um, uh, explain why. So the question is, is our perception of space fundamentally dependent on movement? Or put another way, if you could never move, suppose that you were paralyzed and you would always be paralyzed, would you be able to perceive space? That's the question. So um, this is a test. This is a, it's not a trick, it's a test. It's, it's a, a, what was it, a practical experience? Uh, exposition? Exercise. Exercise. It's a practical exercise. So I'm going to show you two slides, <laughs> and they're going to be called A and B. And um, what I'd like you to do is to watch the fixation cross and just um, perceive what's on the slide. So here's slide A, and here is slide B. Okay? I'm going to show them again. So here is slide A, and here is slide B. So, uh, it's not a trick. Uh, the, the question really is, what's the difference between slide A and slide B? So, I mean, obviously one is labeled A and the other is labeled B. So, putting that aside, what's the difference? Well, what you want to say very powerfully is you want to say the red dot is in a different place. Do you want me to go through it again? Can I not see what <laughs> you really, so That is the response one wants to make. So, one wants to report something about the phenomenology of location. Right? That, that, that's the difference between A and B. It's related to the phenomenology of location. And the point here, which was realized back in the 19th century, in the, sort of, um, in the genesis of experimental psychology, is that two stimuli that differ only in spatial location are easily discriminable. Right? You don't have any problem seeing that the red dot is in a different place. It's in your face. And therefore, there must be some sensory quality that a stimulus has simply in virtue of its spatial location and that which allows this discrimination. There must be some reason that you felt, ah, the red dot's in a different place. And that is the sensory quality of its local sign. So this is a very uh, sort of difficult word which has really dropped out of use but, but was very hotly debated in the early... Uh, um, late 19th century, early 20th century, the local sign of a stimulus is basically where it is. So the local sign is a sensory quality of thereness, okay, of being just there as opposed to there, um, and being in a particular spatial location. So what I'm going to talk about now is sensory quality, but it's a specific sensory quality of being there as opposed to there. How do we experience that? How do we have a phenomenology of, oh, it's there? And these three, uh, again, rather austere <laughs> um, gentlemen um, at the uh, sort of 19th century uh, development of experimental psychology laid out the theory of local sign, which is still, I think, very much implicitly in use in modern cognitive psychology, as we'll see in a moment. So first of all, let's see why there's a problem. It seems really straightforward to say, well, it's there, in it. Can we get on with things? What, why do we need to explain it? And the point that I want to, to mention is there are lots of really bad ways to explain thereness. There are lots of really bad ways to explain spatial perception. So here's one um, really bad way to explain spatial perception, which is to uh, propose that spatial locations on an external object are projected, in this case, into a ventricle, but in this case, um, this is into this <laughs> skin, uh, they're projected into the cortex. And um, simply projecting space doesn't actually explain the sensory quality of it's there rather than it's there. It just defers the problem. So projections of external space to cortical maps are unsatisfactory, circular, kind of just postponing definitions of spatial perception because you end up with a spatial manifold on the output just the same as the spatial manifold on the input. And uh, this was a point that I guess I'd never really understood when I tried to read about local science at all until I read this really, really good book called La Psychologie Allemande Contemporaine. So uh, I don't read German easily. And the 19th century German of experimental psychology is really, really difficult. Luckily, I do read French quite easily. And there's a fantastic book uh, published, I think that says 1879, um, I think, yeah. by uh, 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 Ribot, Théodore Ribot, who was a French psychologist, 
who worked um, and knew the German literature, and he wrote a book just, I think, for French people to try to understand what the Germans were on about, and it really <laughs> brought it home to me, and I felt I understood it. So I'm not going to try and read out the French um, quotes, but the point that Ribot makes is, to avoid circular explanations of space, there must be some non-spatial, non-extensive sensory quality which underpins theirness. Otherwise, you haven't explained it. If you explain A in terms of A, it's not a great explanation. A good explanation is normally reductive. It explains A in terms of B. So you might explain behavior in terms of incentives, right? Um, <clears throat> and the idea here is that we need something which can explain why we perceive spatial locations, but which is not itself spatial. So this is very nicely expressed in that book. And the key idea is that you should, there are better ways to explain thereness, not in terms of the projection into some central sensorium, but in terms of the movements that you would make to orient towards the corresponding locations in the external world. So this is a motoric theory which explains it's there in terms, by reducing it's thereness to the way that you point towards it, okay. in the Descartes case. So, space perception is based on movement. And this is actually really still fundamental to the way that we think. If you look at O'Keeffe's work on place cells in the hippocampus, the idea is that the rat uh, has a, a representation, we don't know what it perceives, but it has a representation of I'm here, which is a kind of thereness, I'm here at this particular point in the arena. Um, and it has that because it monitors the way that it moves around the space. Okay? So, here's a nice quote from a philosopher. A space can be constructed out of any experience as long as the experience exhibits order and regularity such that its course can be seen as simultaneously due to the way the world is laid out and to the subject's continuous motion through it. So it's the movement which actually makes you perceive space. And in the, in the case of the, the place cells, it's the navigational space as you move. But this also applies to um, spatial perception, for example, in vision and in touch. Now, exactly the same idea is features in so-called inactive theories of perception. So there's quite a lot of this in cognitive psychology at the moment. But actually, it's the same idea, which goes back to Helmholtz, Slotzi, and Wundt. And the classical theory in, in, in 19th century German psychology is always based on apparently anecdotal discussions of two examples. Saccade amplitude underpins percepts of visual location. So what it means for the red dot to be there is that this is the saccade that I would make to look at it. That's what thereness for the red dot means. It, it, it reduces to the saccade that you make, the amplitude of the saccade that you make to fixate the dot. So that's a well-established idea in visual perception. And the other example that's always given is that manual movement underpins percepts of tactile location. So the way that this works is imagine that a mosquito lands on my left hand. That mosquito has got a thereness. It's just there. The mosquito is there. It's not there. It's there. Okay? What does that mean? It means that when I want to kill the mosquito, I do that and not that. So it's the motor <laughs> command that you make to orient towards the location of the tactile stimulus on the skin, which is the basis of the, of the, the feeling that it's there as opposed to there. All right? So the manual movement underpins the process of tactile location. So there's a local sign theory for touch, which is all over the original 19th century. Uh, it's, it's given as an example by Lotzi and by Wundt, and it's never been tested. As far as I can tell, I've been unable to find any experimental test of whether our, our tactile experience of where stimuli are in our skin is anything to do with our ability to move. Not, I've not seen it. It's a deep idea, but it's not been tested. Okay. So what we're going to try and do is test it, and we're going to use this rather strange setup, which is a, an artificial form of self-touch. So it's a computer-mediated self-touch based on two coupled haptic robots in a leader-follower configuration. So you make movements with your right hand, and those movements are relayed across the coupling between the two robots so that you effectively stroke your left forearm with this little paintbrush that you can see here. So it, it uh, feels rather like you would get if you were stroking your own forearm. Okay? And this may seem bizarre, but actually we, we do this a lot. If you look at self-touch, it's all over. It's a very, very deep human behavior. There's lots of it. Um, and there, there's some quite interesting psychological theories about why we do it and what it's important for. 
So because we've got a coupled robot arrangement, we can break the normal spatial coupling between movement and touch. We can take experimental control of the spatial relation between how far you move and how far you get touched, the spatial extent of the movement and the spatial extent of the stroking. So I'm making a bit of a jump here because I'm moving from location to extent. For the rest of the actual experimental data, I'm not going to be talking about where something is, but how long it is. If you've read Euclid's geometry, or even if you haven't, you'll probably agree these are related, right? So extent and location are related. They're, they're spatial concepts. So if, you, if the local sign theories are correct, then motor signals, what this hand is doing, and not touch signals, what this arm is feeling, should dominate the spatial perception that people get in this kind of situation. That's the prediction of local sign theory. So we're going to use the fact that we can control this coupling between the robots to randomize the gain between movement and touch. And you'll see this motor colon tactile, or M comma T. That's the way we express the gain. So in some trials, we're going to have a movement of one centimeter cause a tactile stroke of 1.5 centimeters. Now, it's a little bit odd because remember the movement's always on the right hand and the touch is on the left. So here's a one centimeter movement, that's this apo on the right, and that causes a bigger touch on the left. We have the natural case where exactly the movement you make is exactly what you feel. That's what happens in real life when you don't have these uh, robots. And then we can also have a 1.5 to 1 MT gain where you have to make a very big movement in order to give yourself a very tiny stroke. So and we can randomize that completely um, uh, at will. So a few other details which are important. No vision of the hand, so you don't see anything. Okay? Um, you have front and back walls which are implemented by this robot, so that when you move, you move from a back wall there to a front wall there, and that tells you how far you move. You can't decide in advance, I'm going to move three centimeters, I'm going to move two centimeters. You can't do that. You have to go backwards and forwards, and the robot will stop you in a slightly different place each time. And we're going to randomize the game so you can't, um, you can't adapt, you can't learn the relation between movement and touch because it's unstable. Okay, um, I'm now going to take you through to the first experiment. And I'll explain this in a bit of detail because it's, um, uh, it, 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 it's sort of important. So in this experiment, the, um, we're going to look at what happens when we ask people to judge the tactile extent. So we're going to ask people, how long is the stroke that you felt on your left arm? How big would you say that stroke was? And people look at you and think, oh, I can't do that, I don't know. But actually they can. And we ask them to do it by um, uh, controlling the length of a line on a, on a visual screen. So it's a cross-modal match. They have to adjust the length of a line on the screen so it looks as long as the stroke they've just felt. Now, the actual stroke that they just felt was four or six or eight centimeters in length. And the perceived distance, in other words, the length of the line that they reproduce on the skin, this is, this is them telling us how long they think it feels, that's shown on the y-axis. So you can see that basically, as the actual distance gets bigger, people perceive that it gets bigger. That means they're doing spatial perception. That's a sanity check. Now, the really important thing is that there are actually three lines here which correspond to three different motor tactile gains. The actual tactile distance that you're judging is always four or six or eight centimeters randomized, always the same. But you make that stroke on your left arm either by moving a bit or a medium amount or a lot because we can control the gains. Now, the, the way you move is irrelevant. Your job is to say how long was the touch. So there should be no effect of how far you move. You should, all these three lines should overlay each other perfectly. We didn't ask you how far you moved. We asked you how long was the stroke that you felt on your left arm. So the fact that we changed the game should make no difference. But you can see that it does. You can see that there's a big scatter between these three lines because when people need to move a lot in order to stroke themselves four or six or eight centimeters, they tend to think that the distance that they've being stroked is very big, whereas when they only need to move a tiny amount, that's the dark blue line, in order to stroke themselves four or six or eight centimeters, they tend to think that the stroke was rather small. So the red arrow here, which is the scatter of the three lines, indicates an interference of movement on touch. You're asked to judge the touch, but actually information about the movement 
infects your perception of how far you have been stroked. I'm sorry, that's a little bit um, complicated, but just think about it as this. You're trying to attend just to what you feel, but you can't cut out the information about what you did. So perhaps you're automatically integrating what you did and what you felt. You're integrating movement and touch. Okay, so that's what I've shown you here. We can do another condition where now we're going to say, please judge how far you moved. Okay, and you're, we're going to set up the walls of the robot so you either move four or six or eight centimeters. And we're going to ask you uh, to report by changing the length of the line how far you moved. And we're going to do that with different tactile gains, which correspond to different tactile distances that you got when you made the movement. You're only supposed to judge the movement. The touch should be irrelevant. So these three lines, which correspond to the different gains, they should completely overlie each other. But you can see that they're separated. Okay? So... The key thing to notice is that the, different, the spacing of the different colors indicates that movement affects touch, and touch affects judgments of movement. The top row is when you actually move the robot yourself. And here on the bottom, we've got a situation where you hold the robot, and you don't actually move it at all. It moves you. You just hold the robot, and it moves through 4 centimeters, or 6 centimeters, or 8 centimeters. So you've got exactly the same physical displacement, but you don't have a motor command. You don't have anything like uh, an instruction from the motor centers of the brain to the muscles, because it's completely passive. OK, I'll go through this quite quickly. What I'm going to show here is a weighting coefficient, which varies between 0 and 1. I'm sorry I don't have 1 on it. Which is the extent to which your judgment is influenced by the unjudged event. So if you're trying to judge touch, it's the extent to which you're kind of biased by information about movement. If you try and judge movement, the extent to which you're biased by information about touch. You can think about it as, are you able to, uh, to, to, uh, to keep attention just on one of these variables? So if you score zero, then you'd be an ideal observer. If we ask you to judge touch, you would be unaffected by how you move to produce the touch. If you uh, judged, uh, if you... Uh, uh, judge movement will be unaffected by the tactile consequences of your movement. And we show here these weightings for the case where you judge touch, and you see that people are 0.5, sort of 50% interfered with by the motor signal in the act when they actively move, and pretty strongly interfered with when they are passively moved. If you ask people to judge movement, they are highly interfered with by what they feel in touch, whether they actively move or whether they're passively moved. So just to go through this, there are interference effects. The interference effect of movement on touch is slightly larger than the effect of touch on movement. Um, and the interference effects are always larger when you're actively moving than when you're passively moving. And there's no interaction. So I'll just go through to what you would predict on a local sign theory. So if movement information is really the basis of spatial perception, if the way that we perceive extent and awareness is really all down to motor commands, the strong prediction of a local sign theory would be that when you're asked to judge touch, but you make an active movement, you should be very, very strongly biased by the active movement. You should have a very, very high blue column. But if you're asked to judge movement, you should be completely uninfluenced by the tactile experience, because the tactile experience derives from motor information anyway. It's not, it's not an independent source of information. It's ultimately rhetoric. So there should be very strong downward pressure, and there should be zero influence of touch when you're judging movement. So the predictions of local sign theory are total dominance of movement over touch, that's these arrows, and no effect of touch on movement, that's these arrows. And this is absolutely not what we find at all. So there's a small, modest predominance of movement over touch, but there's a strong influence of touch when you're trying to judge movement as well, um, which is really not what local sign theories would predict. Okay, so that's just like summarizing that, and I've got uh, one more um, uh, very brief experiment, I think it's a couple of slides, on perceptual learning. So what I've described so far is the case where the relation between movement and touch is completely random, so you can't learn anything, you can't learn any relation to movement and touch. And if you look at the questions about um, uh, perceptual calibration, that they're all learning questions. If you look at Molyneux's questions, it's about can you learn to... Uh, to perceive touch because of its association with movement. So this requires learning a relation between the two.
Okay, so we're going to do some studies on learning spatial perceptual models by gain adaptation experiments. So the critical thing that we're going to do now is we're going to have a pretest where the gain between the movement robot and the touch robot is one to one. So you move four or six or eight centimeters and the tactile signal is four or six or eight centimeters and you report how long was the touch, you're judging the touch. Then we're going to have an adaptation phase where we permanently change the gain from 1.5 to 1, right? So now, a very a, a movement of 6 centimetres produces a tactile stroke of 4, a movement of 9 produces a tactile stroke of 6, etc., etc. We'll do that for 30 trials, and then we'll have a post-test where we go back to the gain of 1 to 1. So we basically change the relationship between movement and touch in a semi-permanent way. This is exactly what you know, Stratton did, and lots and lots of perceptual learning experiments are like this. And then what you do is you compare the post-test and pre-test, and if there's a difference, then the person has learned to change their experience of touch because of movement information, because you're actually thinking here about touch. We can do exactly the same experiment, um, but now asking people about how far did you move, um, and again, we can uh, have exactly the same actual spatial stimuli, um, but changing the game. So when you do this, um, what I've shown here is the individual trials in the pre-test phase, the adaptation phase, and the post-phase. And this is people's judgment of tactile extent in centimetres. This is how long people think the stroking was. And the three colours are the three sets of trials which are all randomised together, where the actual tactile distance was four or six or eight centimetres. So at pre-test, people are pretty good at judging the tactile distance. When the gain changes, suddenly they start to overestimate tactile distance, and that's fine, that's because they're moving a lot and their, their movement information interferes with what they feel. And the critical thing is what happens when the adaptation uh, phase ends and the gain goes back to one-to-one. -to -one. And what you can see is that uh, there's a slight drop in how long they feel the spatial extent of the touch was, when the gain suddenly goes back to its original one-to-one -one level. So the way that people normally analyze this is they compare the pretest and the post-test, that's what this black line does. You get this adaptation effect, but people don't normally interpret that. What people interpret is the after effect. So you get a compensatory after effect when, after having made very, very big movements to stroke yourself, you suddenly start to make small movements to stroke yourself, or normal movements to stroke yourself. It suddenly feels like the strokes are small, right? That's the after effect. And the existence of the after effect proves that you learned a model of the relation between movement and touch. So the after effects shows that participants learn a new model for, for perceiving space. And the critical question is, is that model a model of movement recalibrating touch, which is what you see here? Or is it a model of touch recalibrating movement, which is what you see in this exactly identical experiment where you ask people to judge the extent of the movement rather than the extent of the touch. This is, this is the last slide. So this is now just looking at the adaptation effects in blue and the after effects in, in, in red. You can just look at the after effects. The after effects are compared to the pretest, which is the, the zero line. So we find, and uh, this is just separated by the different distances, but what you can see is there's a significant after effect which shows that movement decalibrates touch. And there's also a significant after effect um, of touch recalibrating movement. What that means is that the perceived extent that you get when you move four or six or eight centimeters has been altered by your learning the relationship between what you felt here and what you did here. So changes in what you feel lead to a new model of what you think you're doing. Okay? So people learn to integrate movement information for spatial perception of touch. But people also learn to integrate touch information for spatial perception of movement. And this says there's actually moderate support that these two effects have similar size. So if you, we did a Bayesian test of the null hypothesis, and it's just teetering on the end of modest evidence for the null hypothesis. And it's certainly not showing any evidence that movement dominates the perception of touch rather than vice versa. So um, I think I will ignore uh, my suggestion for a non-motoric explanation of why we might perceive space without movement, and I'll immediately say thank you for your attention, and thank you to all these people who um, helped with all the work, and these people who paid for it. Thank you so much.
it's fine to see that those two years in the philosophy department did have some lingering uh, effect on your experimental psychological career. Thank you. Uh, many thanks indeed for the lovely talk. Um, we now have, by tradition, a small break where uh, those who need to slip away can slip away, and those who want to stay for the question can stay for the questions. Uh, so we'll have a brief break here. Um, Thank you very much, Mark. That, that, I'm sorry you cut out the last slide. Well, maybe but, we can ask a question about it. Well, <laughs> yes, I will, I will do just that, because he's the team. I was conscious of the clock, I thought, I don't want to get up to it. So the first question is predetermined, really. Mark, could you tell us what was on your last slide? <laughs> so um, the question is, how could you perceive space if not through movement? So what is, is there any alternative model of how we perceive space? And the, this is just a thought experiment, which is we might be able to learn spatial geometry from temporal order across the receptor mosaic. So imagine that this is your skin. And in your skin, you have 16 receptors, and these are their receptive fields. So there's a, a neuron which will respond when you have touch in A1, and another neuron which will respond when you have touch in B1, and so on and so forth. And in the natural statistics of your life, let's say you're running through the forest, and uh, a twig will cross the receptive fields um, in a systematic way because of the... Uh, spectral characteristics of motion, so we, things tend to move slowly, for example. So you might find that the twig first touches uh, this receptive field, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. Um, and these uh, neurons will therefore fire in a strict temporal order. So the natural statistics of objects moving across the skin will allow you to work out the spatial adjacency of these neurons, because they fire one after the other as the twig brushes across your skin. So you can infer spatial adjacency from temporal order of afferent signals across the neural population. And once you've got temporal uh, spatial adjacency, you can then basically work out space. You can do all the geometry. Because information about spatial adjacency affords the learning of a geometric perceptual field. And we've done some experiments I'm not going to talk about, which show that if you, um, if you stroke people just passively on the skin with a robot, people can do what's called path integration. So path integration is big in animal navigation. So an ant uh, or a person or um, uh, a rat uh, can go from A to B and B to C, and it knows that it can get straight home from C to A. And this is the rat, which is going from one location to another, and then it can, can go straight home. So it's got a cognitive map. That's what we say about an animal that does path integration. And in fact, if you stroke people with these two solid lines, and then ask them to complete the path back to the original starting point. They can do it rather well. Um, so the, the skin supports path integration just through passive touch. That just shows that the mechanism's there. So this means that in principle, we might be able to, to acquire some concept of space just through the natural statistics of tactile stimulation. And there might not be any specific role for motor information. That's the concept. Uh, right. Going to the basic issue of labeled lines, yeah. there's some, some classic experiments on blind people who were able to locate objects and even say something about the texture of the object or the shape of the object. And these people were convinced that they felt this on their faces, that they felt the, the stimulus, and it was called facial vision, okay. um, but it was proved 
that in fact they were doing this using echolocation, you know, where all the echoes are reflected from the objects. But the people themselves were convinced that they were feeling these objects on their face rather than it being an auditory sensation. So, so that seems an example of where you're having an experience of quality which isn't matching the, the label line. That's a nice, um, nice example. So I wasn't aware of that. I was aware of the echolocation literature, but I wasn't aware that it produced a kind of somatosensory hallucination effect. Or, um, so I just wonder whether that is consistent with the idea of quality noise, which I was trying to play with when I was studying uh, cold and sensitive spots, that you can very often mistake the quality, which would imply that you can hallucinate the quality, or you can invent the quality. So um, I think that that wouldn't in itself be surprising. That would just correspond to a sort of criterion setting that there must be, that one would generate some explanation of a phenomenon to explain one's own behavior, and that may be what the blind people are doing. What's interesting is that the, the sort of mechanistic way that labeled lines have traditionally been talked about, that there's something attached to the action potential, like a label, it's, it's metaphorical, but at the same time mechanistic. That doesn't seem to be easy to reconcile with the idea of, uh, um, of, of kind of uh, immune from error, immunity from error, or this self-intimating quality that you know you have a particular sensation. But it's a nice example, I'll look that up. Yeah, I can send you the reference. That would be useful. Thank you. Yeah. Another relevant thing, I suppose, would be sensory quality um, in sensory substitution. So synesthesia is clearly relevant here. It's not an area that I've ever researched, but in synesthesia, people appear to um, mix sensory qualities, which would fit with the idea that there's an important noise component or, or variability. Yeah, thanks for the talk. It was really, uh, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I had a question, maybe more of a sort of summary, because um, before introducing the experiments that you did, you um, mentioned this sort of thought experiment that someone that was completely paralyzed and weren't, wasn't able to move at all, mm -hmm. and whether or not you would have the same sort of, let's say, motor representation. or like Spatial a perception. Speed, yeah, yeah, even whether you would have a concept of space at all, that would be the question. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was wondering, after the experiment, would your answer to that question be yes, but less properly so? Because both seem to influence each other, or what would your answer to that be? Right, they do influence each other, um, as these experiments show, but the idea that all space evolves to or reduces to information and up movements doesn't seem to be supported by this work. Um, and I haven't proved it, but I, I, I think that some spatial perception can be supported in a completely passive um, experiment. So you, you, have a you can have spatial perceptions on your skin. So if somebody writes letters on your back, for example, it's quite a fun game, uh, you, you can read them. Um, now, uh, it's hard to see how motor information is responsible for that spatial um, perception. So I think the role of movement information in producing um, spatial perception may have been overstated. The, the problem with that position is that um, of course, we all have a rich motor history before we come into the experimental lab. And you know, if I write letters on your back and you correctly identify the letters, um, you, you might be completely uh, static at that moment and not using any instantaneous motor information, but you have a long motor backstory, if you like, um, of, of um, having used movement to move through space and to, and to, stimulate, um, uh, to stimulate your own sensory receptors. So it, it's difficult to the thought experiment about somebody who's completely paralyzed, of course, is not one that, that can easily be done. It's just, just a thought experiment. Um, my, I guess there are two things that I would say. So first of all, the, the, the brain's often going to use whatever information it can. So it doesn't particularly surprise me that if you force people to judge touch, they'll try and use motor information if it's there. If you force them to judge movement, they'll try and use touch information if it's there. The brain does the best job it can with all of the signals that it thinks can be integrated. Um, and that's a very standard result in multi-sensory perception. Um, but the, the second thing I'm trying to say is that uh, one can imagine ways that we could have spatial percepts um, which don't directly relate to any motor command.
that, that's that's the point, and that's surprising because that's not what people have traditionally thought in, in history of psychology. Right. I have a question for each part. Uh, for the first part, um, so during the talk uh, when you were talking, uh, I, I, I thought that the inconsistent results were fascinating. That the people inconsistent yeah. reported, and uh, your explanation during the talk was uh, sounded like it was purely based on maybe there is noise at the at the sensory level. But then, actually, during the question session just now, you mentioned another possibility, which in fact is what occurred to me during the talk, which is whether it could just be fluctuations in in you know thresholding. Uh, the incoming information, so like essentially judgment criteria. Uh, you know, are my uh, you know attention fluctuates yeah. so, and so forth, and uh, you know, so rather than noise at the sensor level, it could just be, if you like, noise at the reporting state. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Good, good idea. Very good question. So, um, you've got these two different receptor proteins, which are on two different populations of neurons, so there's two different afferent signals. And the, the, the idea of um, uh, trying to make a decision based on a fluctuating uh, um, signal, signal detection theory, we normally apply to a, to a single channel, right? So here there's two channels. You can think of interesting ways of extending signal detection theory to this, like you can imagine a sort of a a logical channel, which is the exclusive or of the of the two um, the two raw channels. So that, that that's perhaps relevant. Um, I just want to show also this schematic. So the whole idea of label is actually I mean, it's a, clearly a metaphor, right? So action potentials aren't labeled; they don't carry labels. So what, exactly what this metaphor means is quite hard to say. But um, Muller seemed to to focus on this idea that um, somehow the the sensorium knows which of its inputs are active, which I've called labeled reading. Um, if you believe that ultimately these are neurons, classical neurophysiology says that a neuron simply integrates all of its inputs. So I think you know, modern, modern neurophysiology and dendritic computation has quite a lot more to say about that. But exactly how a neuron can work out that one input rather than another is making it fire is not clear in classical neurophysiology. I think. I think Modern stuff's a little bit different. Um, but some of the other writers talk about th this idea that the, the, the label is somehow associated with the receptor, but there's something about the receptor which, which drives the sense of equality. Your, your idea that these could be sort of fluctuating criteria um, seems to me like a, a readout type <coughs> theory, um, and that would certainly be worth, worth pursuing. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting subset of data, which I didn't talk about, um, is, is, is a non-trivial number of neurons which we've called here incongruous. So you can see there's a few of them. Not everybody has them, but this is where the stimulus is cold, and they consistently say it's warm. And then you sometimes get the opposite, where the stimulus is warm, and they consistently say it's cold. So again, it's, it's really hard to reconcile with the way all my theory is written. Um, I'd love to try to apply a kind of noise model of the kind that people now use in medical cognition to this kind of data. And we tried to do that, but the, the um, sort of computational noise modeling stuff tends to work with two stimulus experiments, where you, um, you have you know, one Gabor and another Gabor, and you have to judge something about them, and then you give your confidence. Um, and it doesn't easily extend to this situation where you've only got a single, single stimulus. So perhaps the way to think about it is that although you've only got a single stimulus, you've got two, two receptors and two channels. Um, and that's probably something that we need to work on some more. Maybe that's the way that you're going. Yeah. Can I ask the other question that I have about the other part, or do you want to go? Yeah, yeah, go on. So for the other part, again, there's a distinction between what happened personally to me during the talk and then after the talk. So as you would uh, as you were talking about the results, it, I couldn't help but think that it, it just sounds like classical Q combination in yep. some sense. Great what, what, what's going on? Great and question. then, indeed, during the question session, you were saying that, well, you know, our brain is doing that. Great question. Yeah. So, so, do you think that there is something special here in terms of you know this just being another case of Q combination where you know we are trying to estimate some quantity 
in this case, the yeah. extent, yeah. and we have different sources of information, and we are combining them. And just to yep. give a twist to that question, uh, one interesting um, detail of the results seemed to be that um, active movement yeah. uh, increased the interference effect in both directions. Great question. And so something that I that occurred to me based on that was whether um, you ever tested how much people felt that the two uh, sources of information, so the movement yeah. and the touch, were actually due to the same source yeah. or not, and whether active movement increased their capacity to, to think that it was really the same source rather than not, because then I think that would explain this result. Right, well, I think you must have been reviewer too. <laughs> <laughs> I really was not. <laughs> um, yeah, those are all fantastic questions. So uh, it, it, we set these up as really as divided attention experiments. So we asked what do you feel in terms of touch, or what do you, what did you do in terms of movement? And the way that you're um, describing it in, in terms of cue combination uh, is the sort of experiment where you say how long was it, not, was, well, not what was the extent of touch or what was the extent of movement, but what was the extent of it. And I think this is really interesting because in that tradition um, of uh, cue combination or causal inference, as it's sometimes very confusingly called, the critical thing is the brain has to already have bound the two things together to make a single it. There has to be a single entity whose who's, who's combined <coughs> attribute is judged. I'm looking at the cause and inference uh, variant of that. Where the whole point is that you're also inferring whether there is actually a single right. that's or not. Exactly, that's really important. So um, the, uh, my understanding, at least of some of that literature, is that first you work out whether there's an it, and then if there is an it, you, you, you know um, something about how you can combine the different sensory traces that it leaves um, or that it gives you. So that's exactly uh, a relevant consideration. It would be quite interesting to, to redo this with integration type questions where the question is, you know, do this, how long was it? Um, and look at conflict trials, etc. So we haven't done that. We, we, we haven't done it in an integration way. But so far, we've done it in a attention way. And the reason for that is specifically this, the neurophysiological hypothesis of local sign is a hypothesis that the perception of tactile extent should reduce to purely motoric information. So that is a kind of an asymmetric hypothesis about the individual components rather than about the combination. So that's the historical baggage for why we've taken the methods that we did. Um, it, it, just speculating a little bit more, um, first of all, I never quite know how to ask people, is there an it? So a lot of this work is done in vision and audition. So a, a classic way that people do these experiments is you know, McGurk-type situations. And what, what are they saying? And you see the face and you hear the sound. And, and there, I think, people have a very deep intuition about what the it is. You know, people understand the question. And very often in low-level sensation, sensory motor type work, which is what I try to do, it, it's not clear whether there's an it. It's not clear whether we can get people to perceive these things as being a single object which they can give a single attribute to. And we don't want to presuppose the question. We don't want to presuppose that the movement and the touch are automatically bound. Um, there's a long philosophical literature, um, particularly in French phenomenology in Merleau-Ponty, called Touchant Touché, which is exactly about this and the, 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 the sense in which these, these kinds of experiences are coherent. But in, in, in areas of sensation and perception where we can think about object recognition, it, it, causal inference kind of works, because it's clear what you're asking the question about. It's the object. So what are you saying? Well, I'm, I'm using visual signals from your lips. I'm using acoustic signals from what I hear. And you're the object. It's fine. In, in somatosensation and low-level um, stuff. It's not clear whether there are objects. Here there probably are. The first part of my talk was on thermal. It's not clear to me that there are thermoceptive objects. I'm not sure they even exist. So we didn't want to make any presupposition about there being an object recognition or an object uh, perception <coughs> layer. That's why we did it that way. I just want to take a little moment to say, um, as you exactly say, there's more interference or more integration or more crosstalk or whatever you like to call it when you make a an active movement, in other words, when you have a voluntary motor command, than when you're simply passively moved. And that's true whether you're judging touch 
or judging movement. And the way that we, the reason that I think that is the case, is that when you act, you want to bind in everything that might happen. So I think this is a, a sort of a very low level bit of the sense of agency, which is another hobby horse of a hat, which I'm not talking about today. So I think when we make a voluntary action, we need to attend to all the possible consequences and bind them in, because it might have been our fault, that it may have been a consequence of our action. So we've uh, coined the phrase good mixer, that action is a good mixer. It promotes multisensory integration or multimodal integration, it, or it increases multimodal interference. Um, and I think that's probably um, to allow us to become aware of what we can make happen, in other words, to develop a sense of our own agentic power over our, our sensory inputs. Thank you. Usha. Yeah, uh, when you were talking about the backstory, that's something I was often thinking of during your talk, because yeah. of course when you're a baby, people are passively, you, you are being moved around, yeah. the passive thing, um, and then you learn action and you learn how to integrate so on. Yeah. And would the same be true for your sensations of temperature then? So I think you were saying that um, you know, there's this overlap between what you label as warm and cold. So if you're an infant in an environment where you're always swaddling you up and you That's really interesting. That's a very deep question. So I think this, this part, the actual fact that the trip M8 molecule uh, undergoes whatever the conformational changes is, it undergoes its, its heat sensitive changes um, at this, this particular range of temperatures and the trip B4, that's just molecular chemistry. That's not going to change. Um, uh, but whether there's some sort of experiential part where you learn how to break those apart, mm -hmm. I don't know. It makes me immediately think of asking um, Asifa Majid, who has worked on um, so if effectively experience-dependent changes in perceptual classification and perceptual categorization for things like color and um, objects and so on. Um, it seems like quite an ask to expect people to feel cold and warm differently, but it would well, be that, so there are these anecdotal stories about yogi in, you know, <laughs> who can make themselves warm even though they're sitting on a freezing mountainside and so on. So they're right. somehow controlling something in their body's thermal system. Yeah, that's a really great question. So one, there are two aspects to thermal. One is thermosensation and the other is thermoregulation. Okay. Um, and um, quite often with this work, um, one can, get, one can get them, it, well, it's important to remember the difference. So we need to maintain a constant body temperature and we have thermoreceptors which give signals to the, uh, um, uh, to the nervous centers which can control things like vasodilation, vasoconstriction to keep thermoregulation. That's really, really important, otherwise we die. These are a very small stimuli to a single body part, so they don't have any big consequence for thermoregulation. Um, but they do activate uh, thermoreceptors, which, which can also contribute to that. Um, I, I don't have a clear answer to your question. It, it might be interesting to see whether, for example, um, there's any relationship between uh, thermoregulatory, um, between the precision of thermoregulatory mechanisms, which vary widely from one person to another, and the precision of their thermosensory uh, classification. That would be a doable project. Yeah, so it would be really interesting that people who can't thermoregulate um, do so partly because the incoming sensations are incorrectly attributed to the warm and cold channel. That would be very interesting. There's a perceptual basis for thermoregulatory disorders. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any evidence that it's true, but it would be interesting. Well, Hi. Great Thank you. Talk. Um, I just, uh, uh, returning to the Q combination idea yeah. that Matt has brought up, um, I think perhaps there's a there's a simple explanation for why you would see a stronger influence of, um, uh, of movement amplitude in the in the active than passive. Yeah. So in the passive case, you have two sources of information. You've got the the, the tactile information, and you've got the proprioceptive, proprioceptive yeah. telling you that yeah. you move. Okay. In the in the active case, you have three sources of information: yeah. the proprioceptive, your intended motor command, and the, and the tactile. Yeah. So that would tend to the combination of the, of the two, uh, the motor and the proprioceptive, would be more precise until way more. 
Yeah, that's great and um, very helpful. And it reminded me of something which I meant to say to, to the gentleman before. Um, we thought about that. And uh, the obvious way that you would do the combination is based on precision. So we have, um, I hesitate to, um, but we have, I've prepared a slide. <laughs> so if you look at the precision data, so you can estimate the precision. And I think if I now start it, even a hidden slide will show. I think so, I hope it will. So uh, the experiment that I showed you was experiment three out of a series of five. Um, and these are precision, so it's inverse variance. Okay? Um, and uh, what you can see is that the precision when you judge movement is actually lower than the precision when you judge touch. So that would, first of all, be a little bit contrary to the way that people would often think about, oh, movement information helps because it's more precise and you can do a phase and cue combination. Um, so so uh, we can't see any pattern in our precision data, including in unimodal experiments where you're just touched without moving at all, or just move without being touched. So these are kind of unimanual experiments. We can't see any pattern of precision which can explain the way that the two signals interfere with each other. So this doesn't seem to be an optimal Bayesian integration and are scenario. Are you judging that just on the case where the gain is vertical? Ooh, that's a good question. So here the gains are randomized in this experiment. So it's completely unpredictable whether it's 1.5 to 1, 1 to 1, or 1 to 1.5, which means that the net gain is 1 to 1. So I think this is pooled. I think this is just pooled. Right, that's a good question. Um, there's a, I just want to... <laughs> another thing we did, which is always a little bit um, interesting, but we'll need to be wary about over-interpreting it, is to... Is to Look at into individual correlations. So uh, I wonder if I'm going to get back to my slides. Um, it turns out that there's a very strong correlation between what people do. There's a very strong correlation between what people do in the active and passive cases. So let's just look at these bottom two plots here. So this is the case where you're. Um, judging touch, you're making an active movement, and this is the coefficient of how much interference there is from movement between zero and one. This is the case where you're being passively moved, you're judging touch, and this is the coefficient of how much interference there is from movement, which must now be a proprioceptive signal, because it's passive movement, onto touch. And basically there's a very strong inter-individual correlation, uh, inter-subject correlation. So the way to think about this is people whose judgments of touch are very strongly biased by active movements are likely to have judgments of touch which are also very strongly biased by passive movements. So the efferent motor command doesn't actually seem to make a lot of difference. What seems to be causing the interference between what you do and what you feel is actually a proprioceptive signal rather than an efferent motor command signal. Now that's really interesting because it's not what a lot of the theories in the field would predict. So it's a, it's a really good question, and I, I don't, I'm not, I've got no, I mean, these are the data. It's just so, it was surprising to us that the so-called motor information, which is often thought to be the basis for spatial perception, maybe a lot of it's actually just proprioceptive. A lot of what you use in this task, at least, is, is proprioceptive. Um, I mean, yeah. So you also only saw a small change between active and passive in the uh, in the degree. Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah whereas if, if the efferent command had been really important for construction of space, you would have expected the the uh, active passive difference to be much larger. Yeah. It's significant, but it's not large. Right. right. Going back to the temperature yep. experiments, that doesn't the fact we just have these two main receptor types argue against a simple labelled line theory anyway, because judgments of temperature must be based on the relative responses of yeah. those two receptor types. So you're always taking both into account. Because the response of any single receptor is ambiguous, I see. So, yeah, cool. so, yeah, they do overlap a bit, so um, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. I think you, the, the overlap may be essential for, for doing the coding, just like in colour vision. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good, very good point. Um, I'm not sure I would know exactly how to answer it. I think it would be quite interesting to uh, 
you've got to be a bit careful here because the baseline skin temperature is around 32 in most people. And most people can feel something which is one, a one or two degrees below or one or two degrees above. Um, but you don't need to go much beyond that before you start getting pain. Mm -hmm. So that you get the cold pain receptors. These are shown as responding at, at 15, but actually um, they'll respond even at 20. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, TRIP-V1, which is the heat pain receptors, these will actually respond at around 40. So this graph's a little bit conservative. So the, the actual working range that you've got, if you want to study just these two receptors, is, is quite narrow, and there is quite a lot of overlap. And uh, I don't quite know how to deal with the question of whether the overlap is crucial for the coding temperature. It's a good question. Do you know the recent work in vision that's entirely analogous to these heat and cold spot work? I don't. I don't. Well, I and, until about four or five years ago, it, it wasn't possible to stimulate an individual cold in the retina. People tried in the 19th century, but you can't in fact. Hecht, Schleyer, and Perrin. No, Holm, that's Rods. And, that's Rods. But there's someone called Holmgren who tried it. But uh, now, with optical systems such as Hannah Smithson has in Oxford, uh, you can freeze the image on the retina and you can put a stimulus onto an individual cone. And uh, you get, incons you get uh, inconsistent responses okay. just in the same way. Okay. Uh, it isn't that all long wavelength cones secrete redness and all middle wavelength cones secrete uh, greenness. Uh, so you might like to look at that work. Um, I think I should. It, it's, it seems entirely analogous. Yeah. It, seems, it seems just quite interesting that clearly populations that carry our normal sensory experience um, and somehow we've got stuck with a 19th century theory which yeah. thinks about the line, you know, the, yeah, single, yeah. the single line is carrying the quality. And I think yeah. that doesn't look like it holds up. Yes. Uh, now, Dr. Takahashi had a question. <laughs> this is a bit of the last one. Cheer. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, in your talk that it's a spatial mapping, to change it, manipulate the spatial yes. mapping, I just wonder that it's in the real environment, that kind of the modern technology, that yeah. touch screen or such kind yeah. of things, I just wonder that it's individual optimum spatial ratio is a different one. I mean, that is one by one mapping is a quite common, but maybe individually different, and then maybe the optimum size of the uh, screen may be different. Really interesting. Um, so in, in normal self-touch is, is, is ubiquitous, so we touch ourselves all the time, um, and um, arguably the first functional act that we perform is the self-touch act of sucking our thumb, which we do from around 13 weeks of gestation. So we have a lot of experience throughout our lives of a one-to-one motor -one tactile game <laughs> all the time. Uh, and I don't think um, that will... Uh, no other uh, gain experience will be more common than that, I think, under normal circumstances. What is clear from the literature, for example, on uh, tool reuse and uh, sensory motor plasticity is that we very rapidly adapt to altered gains for motor interactions with the outside world. So there's a lot of work, for example, on the length of the stick that the blind person will use to navigate around the, the streets. And th this, all, um, this is all learned fairly quickly. And we saw from the gain adaptation experiments that I showed at the end that you know, just 30 trials with an altered movement tactile gain um, is sufficient to relearn the relationship between movement and touch. So I guess I would focus on the, the, uh, the fact that there is a surprisingly high degree of plasticity based on a very, very strong prior, that because our bodies are objects in the physical world, there's a one-to-one -one relation between movement and touch. In fact, if you were designing a nervous system and you wanted to save money on not making everything plastic, the one thing I would try to fix is the one-to-one -one relation between movement and touch, but actually the brain doesn't fix it, it's, it's still plastic. 
But it's a good question. I don't think there'll be big individual differences in this as far as I'm aware. It is six, and we should stop here. However, it is our tradition uh, that we can continue in all bar one in Regent Street, um, where it is my obligation to buy the first round for anyone who I've seen at the talk. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, free, you know, the first drink is free, uh, and we'll be there in about ten minutes. Um, but I'd like to thank Patrick, Patrick Haggard, not just for a superb talk, but for really one of the best question and answer sessions that we've had at the Sandwell Club. Many thanks indeed. Thank you.